I used to feel quite uncomfortable actually about the responsibility of um, putting myself out there, doing podcasts, speaking to people. But then I realized that, you know, having reached a position that a lot of people would deem unachievable, I have a responsibility then to to talk about it and to show that, you know, I don't have any superhuman powers. I'm not any different to most people. I've just backed myself, trusted myself, Self and and acted in a way that that is, feels true to me, and it, you know it can be done, and you can do it too. Hi everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of the World Class Leader Show. And today I'm very happy to have with me Verona Frankish. So Verona is the CEO of Yopa. And she started her career in retail and on Marks and Spencer management training program. And then she spent almost 10 years at Marks and Spencer in very various leadership roles across store management, business process audit, women's wear group, and as well as some time in Bro- Brooks Brothers in the US. The second phase of her career was spent more in financial services across three businesses, culminating at Mortgage Advice Bureau. During this time in 2014, MAB completed their IPO, becoming the first mortgage intermediary to list on AIM and remains the UK leading intermediary brand. Then Verona jumped over the fence into property when she joined Purple Bricks in 2018 to lead her mortgage and let divisions. Purple Bricks in the UK largest state agency. And then she left in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, and following a short sabbatical to spend time with her family, great, and was stemmed back into the arena when Yop approached her to become a CEO at the end of 21. And now she's celebrating her first year as CEO at Yopa and Scout, so mortgage business, which forms part of the group. So welcome to the show, Verona. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so congratulations for your first year as a CEO. <laughs> it's gone very quickly. It's gone very quick. I'm <laughs> sure about that. And and I'm sure as well that we have a lot of time to talk about your role now and what does it mean for you and for the organization. So one thing that I noticed from your uh, from your career, so your progression, which by the way is great, uh, you know, you really started from, you know, the you know what we you know I'm, by the way i'm a big fan of course as as many of marcus spencer right so you spend a lot of time there but certainly you started you started management training programs so you designed your career to to have you know better and and, and you know and, and more important leadership roles but it's, it's it's fascinating how you move from you know retail then to financial and then to property do you think that has been incredible actually benefit to your career you know the, the having changed different industry I think I know the answer but I will be very happy to hear from you sure um I think there's there's no question that um I I've chosen a path sometimes by accident but sometimes by design that pushed me out of my comfort zone and I've no doubt that that has helped me become I guess both the person I am today, but also the leader that I am today. Um, If I take myself back, I sort of fell into retail, to be honest. Um, I didn't go to university. I fell into uh, into retail and then I I loved it. But I what I loved most was leading a team, helping people fulfill their potential and helping a business fulfill its potential. And in the retail space that's um it's very visible so um you know my first retail job a very long time ago was in a a fruit store so you start the day with a very packed store and a very packed stock room and you end the day when it's practically empty and the fulfillment and satisfaction you get from that there there's your kpis right there it's very visible yes so the satisfaction from that um, was amazing. And then uh, when I moved, I, ch- I chose to move to London in my early 20s. And at that time, the only retailer I wanted to work for was Marks & Spencer. Um, it, it had a huge reputation as being a great, uh, I guess, grounding for uh, young leaders. Um, so that management program has stood me in really great stead today. But it was also a place that I knew I could diversify I didn't have to be always in a store running a store um so at times whenever it was the most natural progression to move to a bigger store and a yet a bigger store I chose to step out of that and do other things so I moved into our our internal audit department reviewing business processes then I moved into women's wear then I moved and did some work internationally um so yes it was it was at times it was um by accident but others it was very much by design yeah, and I love that. I think it's 
you know, everyone has a sort of mix of design and accidental, you know, career progression in a way or another. Um, but, but I think it's good to mention that, you know, you work a lot on the design area. So the design phase, which is very important to design your, you know, to, to build your own career, what you really want to be. And I think that's what led you to, to Yopa right now. So, and by the way, very quickly, how has been your experience so far in the first year? As a, is a first time CEO. That's my first time CEO. First time CEO. And if I'm being honest, whenever Yopa approached me for the role, my immediate response, imposter syndrome kicked in. My immediate response was, I don't think that's for me. I'm not yeah. sure I'm up for that. Um, and, and I made a decision very early on, actually, in that process to say, oh, let's go along for the ride. I'm also someone who opens myself up to opportunities a lot. So I, I very rarely close doors. Um, so I thought, let's go along for the ride. But what I'm really going to do through that process is just be me. I wasn't going to put myself in a position where I was trying to be what I thought they wanted me to be. So I made the decision that if I was successful and eventually um, being appointed, that would be for all the right reasons, that I could be my authentic self, that they were hiring exactly what I was and not what I was trying to portray so um so that that would that meant that in my early days it was very easy then to carry through with just being me and very early on I identified kind of the key things that I believed we needed to do in the business and 12 months in I'm you know I'm thrilled with the progress that we've made in in that time but I guess um for anybody who's listening who's kind of taken the same sort of leap it's not anywhere near as scary or as daunting or as frightening as I as I thought it might be. Uh, so yes, it's been a it's been a fabulous year, a busy year, um, and a lot of learning, of course, along the way. But that's what that's what makes me thrive. That's where I get my energy. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I mean, gosh, I so love what you said in terms of you know being yourself, no matter you know what is the new role or different yeah. company, and. And by the way, I, I mean, I've seen so many leaders actually, they are putting a mask, really. They're wearing a mask in the organizations because they feel that is what is needed and that's what people want to see. Uh, you know, when I work with, with clients, I think it's it's quite common that, you know, to bring them back to really who they are and what they really want mm -hmm. to be uh, as a person in front of others because the level of authenticity is so important as a leader. So actually, it's great what you're doing. It sounds like it's working so wonderful. And also it's good that no one has asked you to be different, right? Because there is uh -huh. an element of, uh -huh. you know, especially the board sometimes, you know, I'm sure that you have a board say, yeah, but why don't you, you know, why don't you do this? Or why don't you be different, right? So uh -huh. I love that. And, and the imposter syndrome, I think it's it's something that, you know, at some point in life, I think, it, you know, it, it gets to everyone, right? To some extent. Of course, right? yeah. So, and, and, you know, in other parts of my life it actually previously it has held me back and maybe I haven't put myself forward for the promotion or for the job because my mind was playing tricks on me and and trying to help me survive right because that's yes. what your mind does don't yes. put yourself in an uncomfortable position but I want to um and you know I, I think the the more experienced you are the more proof points you have in your ability and the more confidence you gain in the years and in the roles that you've completed, it helps to push that imposter syndrome away. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm I'm really pleased that I did, uh, but there was for a brief moment, uh, an opportunity for me to say, thank you, but no thank you. And I'm really pleased I didn't. Yeah. Well, Actually, I, I recently listened, Andrea, to your um, first time CEO podcast. Oh. Um, and there was quite a few things within that that kind of resonated with me, actually. Um, but one of the key things that um, that I was really interested in was the loneliness piece. And, you know, a lot of people feel they're lonely. And I talk to a lot of business owners, a lot of CEOs, a lot of founders, you know, large, medium and small. And uh, I hear that quite a lot. And it's interesting because I genuinely don't feel that. I don't feel that loneliness. And I think part of that is because I made a decision very early on. I was going to be me. I was going to put on that mask and and with my team as well. Um, you know, I've always said I don't have all the answers, but together we'll figure out the answers. Yeah. I'm I'm not the person who sits in an ivory tower that's um, going to be something different to you. We're all the same. We all want the same from 
this organization. We're all working towards the same goal. So let's do it together collaboratively and figure it out. So that in that way, I don't feel then removed from, from the business and I don't feel lonely, which is which is great. Oh, it's actually it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And and I take your point. What I notice in, in my experience, I think is the loneliness is often correlated to the ability of actually of, of CEOs in particular to be really open, transparent with others to the point that, you know, they feel that they are not alone in the journey. Absolutely. So, so I think that's exactly the reason why you don't feel in that way. I mean, fair enough. Large organization, that level of openness and transparency is sometimes a little bit more difficult for it's a harder. number of reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So I would say loneliness, I think it really different uh, based on situation and context, but I think the approach that you have definitely helped not feel lonely, as you as you just said. Um, can you tell us a bit more about Yopa? So um, without going into too many details, but sure. I'm, I'm more interested in to of course, first of all, give an idea of, about about the business, but also, you know, the the only real question I actually ask to 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 CEOs when you know when when we talk about their companies is more about tell me what is the bold future of Yopa. So, what you really want to achieve in the future that is bold enough to make us excited about your journey? Yeah, I mean that's a a great question because um, you you grapple all the time as a leader in an organization about setting goals and working with your team about what is the vision what is the mission yeah. and how how achievable that will be versus how inspiring that will be for your team so one of the, the first jobs um I, I tackled when i came last year was what is the strategy what is the vision and there wasn't one so that was quite exciting actually to go through yeah. that process of defining that so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second but let me just tell you a little bit, little bit more about yopa in the first place sure. so we are very simply we're a tech enabled full service estate agency business. So we move, help people move home. That's in its simplest form what we do. Um, we, what our part of the market is often referred to as the hybrid sector in that we offer exactly the same as high street estate agencies and often much more because we have a, a platform that our customers can interact uh, with their agent, with their the buyer, et cetera. Um, and we just don't have the bricks and mortar branches that our high street counterparts have. Mm -hmm. um, and we have around 200 agents nationwide currently. Uh, we're currently the seventh biggest in the UK and we operate under a franchise network. So our agents in the field are self-employed. They run their own businesses. And we then have a central team of employed uh, support team that help those people do their job. So we have a mantra in our organization is if your job is not to sell homes, then you should be supporting someone who is. And that's the basis on which we work. So our focus is on our customers. Um, and I guess our my role in this simple form is to help our people and in turn the business to achieve that goal. Wonderful. And are many people working for you at the moment? Um, in our central team, about 130. Okay, great. So great. to your point, Andre, about you know the size of the organization, you know, we're a reasonably small business in, in terms of scale. We're a lean organization because we're um, tech-enabled. That makes a lot of what makes me a good leader a lot easier in a in a mm. that, that size of environment. But I also know myself well enough to know that I will thrive in that type of environment okay. and not in one with loads of hierarchy. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it really suits you, right? You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. This, sure, this job sure. and this problem. Okay, tell me more about the future then. So what is your idea about this future for the organization? Sure. Um, well, to give you some context in terms of the market. So the market in the UK is around about circa a million transactions every year. Sometimes wow. it's 1.2 in, in during, well, post the pandemic, it moved to 1.4 million um, in that year because of the pent up demand. So, but it's circa uh, around that number each year. And it's a highly fragmented market. There's a lot of brands and it's very, very local based. So there isn't, um, there's a lot of local business. There isn't many who, who cover the entire postcode area of the UK. Um, so it's reasonably fragmented. Yes. Um, so my customer base is two really. I have our paying customers, so our sellers and also our buyers, but also our agents. So we very much look at them as a, a, a customer base that we need to make sure 
that we have a proposition, a robust proposition that they feel able to offer the best offering to their customers and then provide the best service. So right. um, it, it's we're still a reasonably young business in that we are eight years old um, and we're still on a, a path to profitability. So the key goal for our business is to create a sustainable business for the future, both in terms of profitability, but also in terms of the planet. And we have put, um, I mentioned we built our strategy last year. So in, in any business, I guess, uh, your goal is always to be number one. Um, and we're moving up the rankings. And our goal is ultimately to become the estate agent of choice where we trade um, by delivering for our customers, our local communities and each other. So that is our that is our purpose as an organization. And um, how we do that is by ensuring that we have a great proposition for our agents. So we attract good quality agents because if we don't attract good quality business owners and agents, then we we can't sell houses. We can't provide the great mm -hmm. service that we want to for our customers. And we also need to have a fantastic proposition for our sellers. Why would they choose Yopa above anybody else in the market. There is a lot of choice, as I mentioned. So if I give you a bit of scale, so the the market leader in the sector has two and a half percent share of that market ish. Wow. So as you can see, it's hugely fragmented. Yeah. Um and and local is super, super important. And one of our challenges as a hybrid um business without branches on the high street when you're selling your property, the traditional way to do that was you can go into the high street, you can speak to the negotiator in the branch, you get comfort and trust from somebody that you know. And building that local trust is hugely important to us. And it's more challenging because we don't have that bricks and mortar building in the high street with the name above the door. Yes. So we're having to build that trust in other ways. So our agents are very much part of their local community and whether that is sponsoring the local football teams, whether that is being part of the business networking groups at a local basis. So we are helping them to be more part of their local community is really, really key to our success. Yeah, you have to build awareness and visibility yeah. in a different way than exactly you know, than the others because they have the the opportunity to have a brick and mortar or put, yeah, yeah. That, that's that absolutely makes sense. Um yeah and and I'll, I'll, you know as a as a customer, of course, uh, living in the UK from in a property world, we definitely see the same level of fragmentation. So I think it's very difficult, I think, for the consumers right now to understand yeah. what's the real difference from one to another. So, yeah. and and you said you're working on the value proposition, really the unique value proposition. You know what makes you different? I think it's great. I think it's very, it's a fabulous starting point for for a company that works in a, such a fragmented and crowded market because it, yeah. it's definitely it's crowded. So definitely. so it's great. Yeah. All right. So great. So given, you know, the, the, the challenge that you see and the goal, the future that you want to build, what, what do you think are the major, you know, really challenges that you see right now? A little bit about the business, but also yourself in terms of leading, you know, this, this organization to a different path for the future. Sure. Um, I suppose as in any role, there are a number of big challenges and lots of little ones on a daily basis. But I think the first thing is to say that I absolutely love what I do. I feel really privileged to be able to lead an organization and a group of people and helping them achieve their goals. So um, even though there are challenges, um, I thrive on that. Uh, you know, that that's Wonderful. where I get, uh, that yeah. I absolutely thrive on that. So um, I guess the first thing is that when you are the CEO, um, sometimes you have to make tough decisions that are not always aligned with what everybody else wants. So, um, you know, in a period of change uh, over the last 12 months, we've we've run a program of transformation as well as a, a, a performance um, program, because I, I, I use this analogy a lot. It's like when you are trying to fly a 747 across the Atlantic, but changing the engine at the same time, you still need to get to your destination. You still need to fly across the Atlantic, but you haven't got the luxury of being able to grind the plane for six months or 12 months in order mm. to, to change the fundamentals of the business. So you have to do the things, the two things together. And the best way to, to or the way that I approach that was to, work with cross-functional teams in our organization to say, what do we want this business to look like in the future? What do we want 
our goals to be? What is our purpose? What is our mission? What are our values? And we we worked with probably about 70 or 80 people in cross-functional teams. And we teased out of them what they want the future of the business to look like. And we set our strategy based on that. So what that meant was that when we then had to make some tough decisions aligned to that strategy, we knew that people were bought into where we're going. So that was sometimes an easier decisions to make. So if I give an example on that, um, we've made the decision this week to actually we announced it this week, we made the decision um, over a period of months that we were reducing, significantly reducing our central office space. And uh, we're doing that for two reasons. One, it is since COVID or since the pandemic, we've occupied probably 25% of that space now versus what we used to. But to those 25% of people, that was, you know, part of their working day, their working life, interacting with their peers, their friends. And that was not great news for them. But because we we explained some of the reasons for doing that is we're building a sustainable future where we're, we're improving our profitability and we're improving our impact on the environment by having less office space. So they understood the decisions and therefore they were more accepting of, of news that perhaps in another uh, context they may not have been so happy about. So I right. think, um, you know, making tough decisions um making the tough calls that is i guess one one of the the challenging things that i face on a on a, on a regular basis and i guess then because you know we talked about the um the highly fragmented nature of our of our industry and uh, our sector that's a, a, an incredibly competitive environment and uh what we have to do is make sure that Whatever we do as an organization, we're competing, but we're competing in a way that feels true to the values of our business. Mm. Um, And I constantly am challenging our own thought processes about our own thought processes about creating a business that makes the right decisions for the longer term, not just for this month or for this quarter. Um, And you know, you mentioned my board. I have a I do have a board. Uh, We're we're um owned by two main shareholders um the daily mail group who you'll be um, familiar yeah. with and, and savills are two main shareholders and as a consequence you know they have invested a, a lot in this business over the years and they at some point will need to see a, a return on that investment they're an incredibly supportive board so bringing our our stakeholders and our shareholders on the journey of making decisions for the longer term sometimes can be challenging but demonstrating to them the game in the longer term and the way that we do this and doing it in the right way um is a, is a i suppose a, it's a battle we're winning right now <laughs> so um yeah so that you know as, as i say keeping everybody engaged in that in that journey keeping everybody focused on where we're headed but doing things for the right reasons is is something that we um we're constantly aware of yeah, and that's really leading a purpose-driven organization. That's essentially yeah. what you are saying, right? I have a couple of comments. One is, back to your point about uh, making decisions that might not necessarily be nice for people. And that's one of the, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, is one of the major, major um, responsibility, but also challenge for CEOs, right? Getting to yeah. the level to the, you know, where we have to say, you know what, thank you, but we have to go somewhere and that's where we're going to go. I think the challenge I've seen in the past is more about those leaders. They want to have a very, which is in, very interesting, by the way, because it's a fine balance. Because you are trying to do a sort of divergent thinking with people, you know, through sessions. When you when you ask them to get different ideas, you want them, but at the same time, then you want to get to the point, then you get convergent talking, so you get a specific thinking. And sometimes people they get a little bit frustrated. They say, yeah, you know, you you welcome your ideas, you welcome suggestion, and then you know you take maybe different path but i think it's needed both of them so i think it's it's a matter not easy to find the right balance on that and on the board which is great what you just mentioned because you know from experience there are some some leaders that really struggle to to lead the board and what they ended up doing essentially is being managed by the board and what they want and i have actually a conversation yesterday with a client that's very interesting because that's exactly what they're facing right now and I think what you're saying is actually demonstration of leadership. That's, I think, what SEO should always do, taking the lead and explaining to the board what direction you're taking and why you're taking that. 
uh, mm-hmm. you know, welcoming, of course, their suggestion, their ideas, because that what you want to do, as you said, involvement and engagement. But at the end of the day, I think it's it's still, I believe, uh, it's the responsibility of the CEO. Right. So, I, I, listen, I, I think I'm not saying by any stretch that I've mastered that yet because it has definitely been a learning curve for me yeah, yeah. for the last 12 months for sure. Yes. Um, and but each month I see progress on that front and I, I, I feel progress. Um, but I think what has definitely helped me was what I mentioned very early on. You know, I was very honest about who I was, what I would bring to the table very early on. I almost pushed them away at certain times and said, if you're looking for X, Y, Z, that is not me. What you will get is ABC. Yes. And um, so therefore I, I'm able to say, but I, I told you this is what we needed. I told you this is how I was going to approach it. And in fairness, you know, they, they are supportive of that. So yeah, I, like I say, I'm still learning. I'm still developing that skill. Um, and I will, continue to develop ad infinitum because that's what you know i definitely believe that if we're not growing as individuals then you know scientifically if we're not growing we're dying so i like to push myself and 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 grow and develop new skills all the time yeah and you know in in the process then you get challenged and then that's the way how you grow yourself and you stretch Mm -hmm. you know yourself out Mm -hmm. of your comfort zone that's exactly what you're sounds like that that's what you're doing so yeah, and I, I mean, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task, especially if you are a newcomer, right? As a CEO, so you yeah. still believe and and rely on the experience of the board members, if they, of course, like yours, they they understand quite well the market. So, you know, it, it, I think it's very normal. Great. So we mentioned about the challenges primarily from a business standpoint, mm-hmm. um, although you know it's always you know there are not two different things, right? Business and then your personal leadership as a CEO, but I'm more curious now, more into your personal sphere, your leadership as a CEO. What are other challenges that you probably have as uh, as leaving the role of a CEO, if you like? So, I mean, you mentioned sure. before earlier, you know, the imposter syndrome that probably is getting now much better than what it was before. Any other interesting tips that you would like to share with the audience that might they might face the same thing, or maybe they are. Sure. They are ambitious. They want to get, you know, to the to the lobby CEO, but they're a little bit concerned about, you know, okay, what do I need to become? What do I need to do in order to be a stronger CEO in the future? Or some lessons maybe that you want to share? Sure. Um. But let me start with something. It isn't quite answering that question, but I I think it's something that really helps me to straddle the two things. So the the person, the mom, yeah. the wife, the mother, you know, all of those things, and and the CEO. Um. When I get together with my team on a monthly, my leadership team, uh, which we do once a month, before we start our agenda, our day, we check in uh, around the table on each other and they have to check in, uh, score themselves out of five and they're not allowed to use three because that's a cop out. Um, (laughs) And they score themselves on how they're feeling personally and how they're feeling professionally. Wonderful. I love that. And the reason I, I've done that from the very first time I got them together, and the reason I do that is because I say to them, you know, you don't come to this table as a robot with a, with a title. You come to this table having left the kids at school or challenges with, you know, husband's job or wife's job, um, parents' worries about concerns about health, all of those things. So before we start our day together, it's really important that we get a gauge as your colleagues and your friends on how we can support you and is there anything we need to be aware of so if you're a bit off color today that we're not being judgmental that we're being supportive and we understand that so that has been a, a, a brilliant very very short kind of half hour thing that's really helped us as individuals also uh, gel more for sure but also understand more about each other um, and and operate better as a team for sure and by the way that thing it's not just great from an emotional standpoint and emotional intelligence, empathy, but it's also great to build in trust in a team. So, for sure, great. For great. Sure. So, um, I guess back to um, therefore my personal challenges and how I would check in, and I'm always incredibly honest with them about how I find it. So, I'm a mum. I've got uh, three kids: an 18 year old daughter who's just gone to uni, a 16 year old son, and a 10 year old daughter, and. It's hugely important to me that um, I'm a role model for them. And I've they're very aware throughout my career that I know myself well enough to, to say that I'm a better mum because I go to work. And for a lot of people, 
be in a better mum means spending more time at home. And that's amazing, fantastic. But I knew very early on that that wasn't what was going to fulfill me. And I think my fulfillment is equally important to be in a good mum as it is to whether I stayed at home and right. be a good leader. So um, I've also incredibly fortunate to have an incredibly supportive husband. Um, so, you know, we, he's also got a, a very successful career and we've pretty much tag teamed and spreadsheet managed our lives over the last 20 years, <laughs> you know, and a lot of families will resonate with that. But um, it takes a lot of operating, but also it takes a lot of sometimes I'll just say to my, you know, my team. I won't be available after three o'clock because Lily is singing actually today in a tea times concert after school. I won't miss that for the world. That's that is important to me. And the same is true of my team. And when you have that trust and that open relationship, it means that, you know, they're not pretending that they've got a meeting at that time. They're calling me and saying, Finley's got a, a concert this afternoon or he's playing a football game. I'd really like to watch it. And, you know, and I don't even they don't need to ask for permission for that. That's just the way that that we operate as a team. But I know that we get um, we get that loyalty and that trust back in space. So, um, yeah, so I think that is kind of the, the the part of me that that's me. And it's massively important that I'm authentic and true to myself and not pretending to be something else. The flip side of that, Andrea, is that I work in a that is largely male dominated mm. um and particularly at leadership level uh, there's very few ceos in um yes. in a state agency um and that was obviously amplified over lots of different industries but um i'm therefore a huge advocate for um sh- putting a spotlight on to women who have been successful in society's terms have made it up the career ladder have find a fulfilling and satisfying career that demonstrates to other women who want to the sa- want to achieve the same thing, that it can be done. You know, silence that imposter syndrome in your head, have a word with yourself and, you know, believe in yourself, back yourself, because it takes, I guess, and I feel, I used to feel quite uncomfortable actually about the responsibility of um, putting myself out there, doing podcasts, speaking to people, um but then i realized that you know having reached a position that a lot of people would deem unachievable i have a responsibility then to to talk about it and, and to show that you know i don't have any super human powers i'm not any different to most people i've just backed myself trusted myself and and acted in a way that that is, feels true to me and it, you know it can be done and you can do it too so I think that for me, that is something that's massively important that I'm an advocate for women in business. I'm on the committee of a women in a state agency group. We're, we're running our first conference on the 2nd of March. And, you know, so I, I do a lot. I, I mentor other females. I, I coach. So there's a lot of things that I do outside of my own job that means that I um, advocate for support and champion women in business particularly. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. And to some extent, is uh, by the way, it's great. And to some extent, it's also sad that, you know, we're still talking about, you know, this this Absolutely. thing about women that needs to speak up to show to others, you know, other women that it's possible and you can actually have a very balanced life by also having leadership roles. But you're right. I mean, I come from a very, very male-dominated industry too because I have a different background. I come from energy, the oil and gas particular industry where, unfortunately, you know, it's has been always a very male-dominated environment. So I, I can I can see, you know, the frustration and feel that, you know, from people that are taking, you know, um, a career path that hopefully, you know, it can bring them to, to where you are right now. I think, and by the way, I, most of the people that are coming to the show, uh, maybe you know, maybe the audience doesn't doesn't notice that, but uh, they are women. So I love interview women, not 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 for a specific reason, but because I think that's something more to say, and they deserve more space than others. So that's why I think it's it's wonderful bringing your experience and your story too. Okay, great. Um, maybe the the last really question I have about being a CEO is you mentioned a bit more about you know a little bit earlier about. Isolation is not necessarily something that happened to your life, although it's, yeah. it's a sort of, you know, um, perception that we have about CEOs. There are other misconceptions about CEOs, something that people, you know, 
think, okay, that's what happens to the CEOs, but in the reality is not. So you mentioned about isolation. There is anything else that would be interesting for people to know. In other words, the, the real question is, you know, what really happens behind the scene in your life as a CEO? Something that people necessarily don't see because, you know, it's something that you keep for yourself or it's something that you don't, you know, you don't, you don't normally share because you think it's not necessary. So tell me more something um, that I don't know. Oh, cracky. Um, I think <laughs> if, if in terms of um, maybe misconceptions about CEOs, um, well, first of all, there's a huge misconception that CEOs are male. So I quite yes. often, um, I quite often will correct people when they uh, they default to that position. So that's probably the first thing. But yes. as you rightly say, Andrea, it's absolutely sad that we should even be having this conversation because it shouldn't be a thing. But until it isn't a thing, then we have to keep we talking should do. about yeah, it. As exactly. A thing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, right. I, I guess uh, you know, in its simplest um, form. CEOs don't have all the answers. You know, you're not the font of all knowledge. You don't have it all figured out. You don't um, have a path to the end result that is crystal clear for you. And for me, I don't, I don't see that as something that um, for me, I'm worried about sharing, but I think I've seen a lot of other examples of where that is true. And um, dare I say, you know, not only males, <laughs> you know, and I, I think there's been um, misconceptions where people talk about having complete clarity on a plan or complete clarity about what the answer is. And actually, the best way to get that is to, to talk to people, to ask the right questions, to listen to what your customers are telling you, to listen to what your people are telling you, because the answers are there. Mm -hmm. You're maybe just not choosing to open your ears and listen. And, and we're all guilty of that, right? We're all guilty of that. And particularly when there's pressure, particularly whenever there's other challenges. Um, so yeah, you know, I, and I I openly say it, as I've said before, you know, I don't have all the answers, but but we will figure it out. Um, but we need to work together to, to get there. So yeah, I, I don't know if that's kind of a, a secret enough, but um, that's probably something that I would say is a huge misconception. No, I think I think you're right, hundred percent. I mean, there is this belief. I hope it's not anymore, but I think there's definitely a belief that you know CEOs have all the answers. You know, they can steer organizations. You know, during change like this, they know exactly mm -hmm. where, 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 where to go. <clears throat> but I think I saw all of your point about you know about listening, and I would have probably add listening intentionally. Which I mean, it, it might look semantic, but it's not. You know, intentionally for really understanding what people you know think, and most importantly, their point of view. Because as you say, there are so many great ideas there. It's just a matter of you know, opening you know ourselves and really listen intentionally. Because yes, the idea is there. Absolutely. But, and I think that, you know, to your point, when there is pressure, unfortunately, as well, maybe people tend to do. They default into. Yeah, I don't have time to listen right now because there's so much things that we have to do. Let's exactly. do it because, right? Yeah. So, yeah, great point. Bernard, I would like to ask you the last few quick questions to understand a bit more about your personality. Um, sure. So one thing is about learning. So I'm really a huge fan about learning. So more, essentially, these are the questions for you, the three questions. So, <clears throat> and I expect a quite quick answer, so no worries. So is there any, one, any specific learning, one learning you know, across all your in brilliant career, you know, when you change path and, you know, something, you know, something happened incidentally, something happened by default and now as a CEO. So it's amazing. So if there is one learning among many that you would like to share with the audience about your story, sure. your career. Yeah, I, I think um, the biggest learning for me, which has led me to this point today is um, always be open to opportunities um, and when I mean open to them, I also mean prepared for them. So um, I don't believe in luck. I think, um, so, and I don't take credit for this quote, someone else um, said it, but I love it, is luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yes. And I truly believe that that to be true. It's a great um, quote. Yeah, you know, it is. Put the work in, learn, <clears throat> you know, learn things that aren't necessarily necessary for you to know today, but where, be curious, always always want to know more about a subject that's going to help you grow and develop because you just never know when an opportunity to utilize that will come around the corner and then grab it with both hands. Um, 
I there's no question that I wouldn't have been in the job that I'm in today had I not pushed myself and taken all the opportunities or searched and sought down and you know fought for the opportunities over the years so yeah I think that's probably the biggest learning over my career that's wonderful and I'm like you so I think we are really similar on that so it's taking opportunities when they arise because you never know actually whether there will be other opportunity in the future absolutely as long as you know you calculated the risk of taking the the opportunity of course because not all opportunities are good by the way but you mm -hmm. know having a little bit more I would say tendency to take it rather than to, you know, to, to be reluctant to wait. So I love that. That's how we grow. That's how we grow. So wonderful. Yeah. On the other end, is there anything, anything that maybe you would have done differently in your career? Something that is, look, that's just a fascinating question because everyone really has a very, very different answer. Mm -hmm. And then I'll tell you what most people say, but I'm curious to hear your okay. thoughts. <laughs> um. Okay, so in terms of doing anything differently, um, so I'm, I'm definitely not a person that ever really looks back with regret because yeah. even the bad decisions that I've taken or mistakes I've made, I've absolutely learned from them. Yes. Um, and that's critical. Uh, so that's, I guess that's the basis on which um, the probably the one thing that I wish I'd done differently is I wish I'd understood better how I could control my mind earlier in my life and in my career. So the power of what you think is not necessarily true and the, the power of controlling those thoughts, which then influence how you feel, which then ultimately influences how you act and checking myself and understanding that better earlier in my career, I think could have helped me unlock a lot more potential earlier on. So I wish I had grasped that concept a lot earlier what I would say is over the last 10 years in particular there's been a lot more access to that learning that teaching a lot more resources books podcasts thought leadership in that space um and I wish it had been available earlier but I also wish I had maybe tapped into it earlier wonderful um so yeah so many CEOs actually answered the same they say look I don't live with regrets. I think I'm where I am right now based on all the experience I got, uh -huh. positive and negative. So I'm with you. And the, the second part is is a base of my work. So um, I love what you say. It's perception shape our action 100% of yeah. the time. There is no other way to think about it. That's why when yeah. we ask people to change their action behavior, sometimes it works and most of the time it doesn't because until yeah. their perception are in place, it would be impossible. So yeah. I love that you got that. Uh, final question about learning. So you say, I, I know that you love podcasting because we spoke before, uh, you love books. Is that your approach to learning? It sounds like you are a person that really love learning. So if that's true, is there any specific book in mind that shaped your life or your career or anything else that might have really had a, such a big impact on your learning? Is there anything Sure. Sharing. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, <laughs> but so that there's definitely two books. And the reason I, uh, I would say two books is one because it, it's one that really influenced my mind. And the other one is influenced my approach to business. So okay. the one that influenced my mind was The Chimp Paradox by Steve Peters. Yeah, I've had heard Steve speak uh, publicly, and I've, I've read the book, but th that explained it in, in a way that I could um, digest and understand. So it yes. made it very simple for me to very put that simple. into practice. Yeah. So that was that one. And then the the book for business was The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. I love the, and I truly believe in um, creating, making the right decisions to create a sustainable future, not decisions that are very finite to win today or tomorrow. Um, so both of those things uh, have massively influenced me. Um, but I would also say that one of the things that has significantly influenced um, how I look at life, leadership and my role is um, the emergence of podcasts. And I've, I've come to, um, to yours more laterally. And as I said, I've listened to a few of them already. By the way, I thought Renee from Mercer uh, a few weeks ago yeah. was a fantastic episode as well. I love listening to her. She was she was fantastic. Um, but there's another broadcast series that I listen to a lot, Stephen Bartlett's Diary of yeah. CEO, which yeah. has been, um, which I've absolutely learned so much from the, the the guests that he has on there. And and again, it, it makes you realize that 
founders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, they're only human, right? There's no superpowers. There's no secret sauce. Um, there's just an absolute belief and practicing all the right attitudes, approaches and mindset to success. Um, and so, yeah, that's been hugely helpful for me. Oh, that's great. And I'm glad that you mentioned Steve's book, podcast because I mean, all, it's fascinating. All the conversations with guests, they start with, you know, from a personal business standpoint, but quite, you know, kind of a standard conversation, but that they all get very emotional because for the good question that Steve asked, yeah. also for the openness and transparency that people actually have. Share, and they share with him a lot. And they it's share wonderful. everything. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. wonderful. It's not even expected mm-hmm. to some extent because, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. most of these people are personalities, mm-hmm. you know, people that have an important role in society exactly. in a way or another so can i yeah. ask you a question andrea did sure. you have a favorite episode well um definitely the the episode with muhammad gawad i think it's called oh my um, goodness episode 101 yeah yes. and i know steve we'll really loved that yeah yeah about about being happy happiness yeah. that was wonderful it's, it's wonderful it's been one of my it's still one of my biggest question in life is be happy how to be happy yeah and the episode sometimes i go back and listen again because it it's mind-blowing likewise so. yeah it really is but but i love his equation and how he simplifies happiness and it's so true our expectation yes. level and how we view life is so inextricably linked to our happiness level yeah it's one yeah. episode it gives a completely perception really and perspective mm-hmm. as well about, yeah. about happiness so Veron, that was so great. I think we can we can talk for hours, probably you and me. But, <laughs> but I think could. we should, we could. I think we should go to to the end of this. That was amazing. Um, where do you like people to go if they want to make any contact with you or maybe understand more about Yopa? Sure. Um, so I am on LinkedIn, Verona Frankish. Um, I'll send my link to you so you get my. Yes. You can post it. Um, and Yopa is also on LinkedIn, but also on Yopa.co.uk. Yeah. Check it out, guys. Check it so, out. <laughs> Verona, thank you so much, really, for being with me today. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. I love the chat.